and I want to welcome everybody here tonight. We want to talk about media's role in the election and um, look at, you know, I know we all have an opinion, a political opinion, but we want to try to make this conversation very much about role, the role of media, technology, data, social media, et cetera, in informing the po political process and then also hopefully look towards the future and um, how we might be able to use media and technology for some positive change. I just want to set out a few little ground rules and that's idea that I know, again, this is really emotionally charged um, and we want to make this a safe place for everybody. So let's try to stay on topic as much as possible and also we want to have everybody's voices heard. So you might hear me from time to time kind of nudge you, rein you in so that someone else will have an opportunity um, to speak. But I'd like to go ahead and open it up. Stay on mute if you can until you're ready to speak. And uh, we'll, we'll have this for an hour. We'll record for an hour. So I'll go ahead and open it up if there's uh, someone who wants to start the conversation. Uh, if, if I can start, I was just writing a post in Facebook when this started. So uh, uh, full disclosure, I was for Hillary. And uh, all of my friends are very sad, and uh, I mean, some of them uh, are not proud of being Americans anymore. But uh, in in my opinion, I think that fail was that uh, uh, Hillary's rhetor uh, rhetoric, as as good as it was to me, uh, she failed to include uh, the people that are still a majority in this country, white people, and specifically straight men. And uh, uh, the, everything in social media was about uh, how Trump uh, attacked Mexicans and Muslims and women. And we didn't uh, try to see why he was appealing to white people. And we failed to, I mean, we were demanding uh, Trump supporters to feel empathy for minorities without trying ourselves to put ourselves in their shoes and, and, and find out, okay, if, if this guy is saying all these mean things, um, I mean, in our opinion, why are people still supporting him? And we didn't question ourselves and, and, and everything was negative. And had we tried to understand why straight white men were supporting him, why they were afraid, why, uh, what part of uh, his rhetoric other than xenophobia and uh, misogyny was appealing to them, I think the result would have been different. And, uh, and another thing I think was a mistake was that uh, Hillary didn't embrace her nasty woman persona from the beginning. And when you see the videos of her campaign and uh, um, uh, her husband's campaign in the 90s, she was, uh, uh, I mean, that's when people started calling her a robot because she was much colder, she smiled mo uh, less, she wasn't as friendly as she's trying to uh, be now, but she was more authentic. And she was attacked for that and tried to change. Uh, somebody advised her to be nicer. And I think that was a mistake. I think... We like her because she's strong and because she uh, can give a fight. We don't like her because she smiles. Or so, Carlos. So, how would you then have changed? So, my understanding is what you're talking about is that the media messaging that was put out um, didn't align with with um, who she was. Is that what you're saying? And how would you switch that? So, you said she didn't address the um, nasty persona. So, yeah, she did, she did, yeah. I, I, I said that she didn't address her real persona and she tried to create a different persona, trying to appeal everyone. And uh, Trump didn't create a different persona, he showed himself just as he is. And that's why he was more appealing because he came across as more authentic, even if. People didn't agree with his uh, with everything he said. He sounded more real to these people, whereas 
she didn't sound as real for to everyone. You know, I, I, I would like to also chime in. I also think that she missed a key opportunity to um, engage the African American community. If you look at all of the, if you look at all the exit polls and the numbers in those cities, African Americans, uh, you know, were down by ten percent. So what? So when we look at the radio ad buys, when we look at the social media buys that were there to attract those communities, they were not. She missed a great opportunity to have her surrogates. Barack Obama is 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 our idol in the African American community. She did not use him at all in any of her commercials to the African American community till the very end. That was too late. That took people for granted. And then what happened in our area here in Philadelphia, urban America, Trump ran this ad that um, talked where she talked about African American young people as super predators. That resonated very well with the African American community here. So I had young people literally coming into the polling place telling me, why is she talking about my children like that? Why is she saying these things about my children? And that was during the crack epidemic. So she missed, she missed a key opportunity, I think, to uh, connect with African American radio, African American talk shows. Um, she 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 just chose to, and, and also too, Carlos. I think that she did move towards the white community, and they were the ones who let her down. She lost tremendously in all of those categories, all those demographics that she thought she could count on. That's where she spent her dollars and she blew it. The, the African-American community, Hispanic community, she did very little buys, very little. In Radio One, they got nothing in buys for advertisers. Shameful, she had a ton of money. She could have easily spread that money out amongst black radio and done much better, I think, in those areas and, and moved it a point or two. And that's all you needed in this race when you look at the numbers, was a point or two in Cleveland, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, that would have cost her to carry the state of Pennsylvania. That would help her carry Ohio. That's what Obama did. Carry North Carolina. He went right to the African American community, and they pulled him through. So it sounds like there's. Go ahead, Pam. Oh, uh, I just wanted to add something, uh, or or to to what Chris's comment, which is that what one of the things that I think was very interesting about the messaging Hillary compared to Trump is that. You were just using a perfect example of how Trump used images in his messaging. In other words, he used words that created these powerful images so that actually the messages kind of fell away after a while. And so you just had these sort of sticky images, whether they were accurate or not, that people carried. And Hillary never was able to paint a picture that was as sticky. So you could have these debates where substantively, Hillary said much more than Trump, yes. but Trump painted all of these pictures that stuck with people, and then people had the perception that he won the debate or that he was equal in the debate in terms of the content. And I thought that what your example is really perfect for how he was able to take a very poignant picture and leave it in people's brains in a way that really shifted their perceptions. And also, too, Pam, just one other point. When they ran that commercial, Super Predators, I was working for an African-American mayor who wanted her to say those things. He never stood up and said, you know what? I was the reason why Hillary called them Super Predators. I was a ma mayor of a major city. Crack was killing our communities, and these, these people were doing it. And no one stood up. The, the, the religious community didn't go on the radio, didn't go on the talk shows, and diffused that. And that cost us. That really did. It really did. Uh, did this is Susan, and I had a, another set of observations. Um, I and, and, and I'll come in a bit on on uh, a, a few things that you all have said. But one thing uh, that I observed was that, that both of these candidates were truly disliked at the beginning of the campaign. So that made it very difficult for people to connect with them emotionally. And I would imagine that's why Donald Trump was so discounted by the Republican Party leadership and certainly by the media. But there's one thing, and I'm going to try to synopsize this because for those of you who don't know me, I have an extraordinarily long political history and I do analysis and that kind of stuff. But 
Donald Trump did what, if, if you remember, I don't know if anybody's taken political psychology, but it's Weston and Lakoff. And they talked about how the Republicans are very effective at tapping into the emotion. And that's what, um, Pam, you were just talking about, and, I, and uh, someone else was just talking about. They talk about things that, that grab people emotionally and not intellectually because that's not what most voters pay attention to. And that's what Trump did. Not, my observation was at the beginning, I guess I just watched how he went through and was marginalized by the, the quote unquote Republican leadership. The media discounted him, never questioned the lies he told. They never stood up and did their job and, and held him accountable for the things that he said, he got a complete pass on all of that through the nominate through through the the, the process when he was on the road to the nomination. Mm -hmm. And good point. All of the people just held on to that. They because he looked at it not from a political perspective, but more from a consumer perspective. And as, as I looked at it, and and I'll just tell you, I've done four presidential campaigns. It looked to me like Trump said, this is what these people care about. I'm going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And so he tapped into the emotion. These people have pent up frustration that goes back 35 years because they've been lied to, misled. And by Republican <laughs> leadership, they supported policies. You know, so so this is when we get into the issues of implicit bias and and the stereotyping and the whole privilege issue. And this group generally believed that they should have the privilege. There was a really interesting article in the New York Times that talked about where do they go? Because with political correctness, be, before we had civil rights and all of that, there was meaning and value to their whiteness. It was privilege. Mm -hmm. But if you have affirmative action, and if you have all of these policies where you're bringing in immigrants now, they have to compete for jobs before. They, they, these aren't people who are looking to be millionaires. They just want to do well and see their next, the next generation do better than they did. All of that's been taken away from them. And they seem to be competing with everyone and they're looking for change. They don't know what kind of change it's going to be. They don't know who's going to bring it. But that's what Obama promised. Obama got a crossover vote. He didn't get elected strictly by Democrats. So it and is. So what the same I'm thing happened with Trump. <clears throat> so what I'm hearing from you, Susan, and a lot is following along in the chat as well, is that the idea that um, Trump was uh, was uh, particularly good at messaging and in controlling the media. Um, I already missed who it was. I think it was Michael Bell saying that Trump neutralized the media um, by calling them out. And then a lot of commentary, and, and folks might want to speak up about this because I know several of you talked about this, is that that picture of Hillary was painted by others and other, a lot was talking about the imagery around Hillary. Does someone and want to follow I, that up? Gary, awesome. if I, yes, sorry. Gary. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, Susan, as you know, I've taken political psychology several times. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Gary. <laughs> for those of you that are on the call that don't know, that's uh, Dr. Gary Hare, and he actually teaches our, our, our uh, political media psychology course at Fielding. Recommend it to everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, you know... Um, I, I read a little email. Some of you may have read it. And I was talking about how I, I, I wasn't terribly surprised uh, 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 about this. I was a little dismayed, but not terribly surprised. Um, the Obama coalition wasn't just minorities. Uh, it, it was heavily working class white people, uh, particularly, mm -hmm. particularly union families. And when you look at the numbers yesterday, uh, Trump won almost all of that. Yeah, uh, he won union families by a lot, which which kind of surprised me. I, I I thought that he might win the poor white vote, but he won union families by a lot. When I looked at, I was on the Secretary of State site for the for Florida for about two hours last night because I thought that would be the most interesting. 
when you look at some of the uh, upstate counties, uh, Obama uh, lost to uh, uh, whatever his name was by six to eight percent, and Trump was winning by forty percent, fifty percent, sixty percent. These people are angry. I mean, these are the people. The fourteen million jobs were lost in the recession. Eleven million, million houses were lost in the housing recession. Uh, in Michigan alone, almost a million people lost their homes. I mean, these people are pissed off, and 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 nobody listened to them. You know, the Democrats sure as hell didn't listen to them, and Trump was just their vessel. I mean, it, it, you know, it, somebody was somebody was basically saying, "Hey, I'd like to go blow some stuff up," and they said, "Yeah, me too." Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I don't think there was an ideology behind this vote. Uh, now, there's a certain amount of racism, of course. There's a certain amount of uh, you know, white nationalism, there's a certain amount of fascism. But even if you add all that up, we probably don't get much more than 15%, 18% of the vote. Mm-hmm. There's just a lot, of, a lot of disappointment, a lot of anger, a lot of feeling that, th- that they, had le- they had been left behind and that it was a rigged game. The most interesting thing to me in all the exit polling yesterday, I think it was the Morris poll, where they, I, they asked the Trump voters, if you couldn't vote for Trump and had to pick a second choice, who would you pick? And Bernie Sanders by a landslide was the second choice of the Trump voter. And I think they tapped into the same thing. The, one, the only silver lining, if there is one in all of this, uh, the next two years are going to be a mess. The Republicans will overplay their card. Uh, they always do. Democrats do when they get power of all three houses as well. And, uh, and, and we'll see a political reaction to that. And, and uh, the, so, the Democratic Party has to really look at themselves in the mirror. They have to really say, are we progressive or are we just Republican light? I mean, and, and they really have to take that very seriously or they're screwed. I'd yeah. like to touch on a couple of things here that have been brought up just a moment ago from Susan and now from you, Gary, in a different way. And largely that is uh, the idea that Trump connected with the voter through emotion, uh, where, where Clinton was unable to um, and only tried through uh, intellectualism. And really, it's not the voter, but the viewer. Because if you go to certain, my, my, my mother and my brother voted for Trump. They're in North Florida. My sister-in-law in West Florida voted for Trump. My brother down in South Florida voted for Hillary. And you go to these places and you talk to these people. Um, and, you know, friends and all that kind of stuff we talk about in North Florida, they've been angry for years and they've been throwing the, the uh, uh, you know, the protest vote for years because they have felt largely ignored for years. Unless you live in a metropolitan area or you're near a place, a media center, then you're ignored. That's the feeling. And when they, when they vote, it's the only time that they feel heard in a lot of ways. And it doesn't really matter who, and I, this is where I'm like completely agreeing with you, Gary, about it not being an ideology thing. It's just let's blow things up. And I think that that brings us to where the media carries a great responsibility. My mother, who raised me to be the person that I am now, and I, 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 I can vouch for the fact that uh, there was no racism allowed in my house and there was no, um, there was no, you know, you, you gave your shirt to the person next to you. And that certainly is not the rhetoric that I hear coming out of the Republican Party this time. And I think that, uh, that when you're given a diet of Fox News, which is what she lives on, and my brother down in South Florida is given a diet of MSNBC, which is what he lives on, it, it, just, it just screams that we have a system, not political system, but a media system that's been broken for 30 some years now since uh, cable news entered our, our world. And since the um, idea that, that the airwaves are no longer a scarce resource came into vogue. Sean, you know what? But yeah. by talking about that media diet, it might be um, a apropos time for John Robinson to jump in since his dissertation, his FOR, will be tomorrow. And this is one of the areas he's studying <clears throat> because that is an interesting thing about um, self-selecting and what, what kind of media diet that we're, we're taking on. Hi, this is John. I, I just have a couple of thoughts here. One is I don't think the media is failing because – 
I think that the media has a vision of its purpose that may not align with other people's visions of its purpose. But in a free enterprise system, the purpose of the media is to draw an audience and sell it to advertisers. It's not necessarily uh, to be the fact checker and um, verifier of every political statement. Um, I think that that was a role that the media played voluntarily, uh, but that was driven by market demands, meaning people wanted it. I don't think there's a big appetite for that anymore. I think that there's some appetite for it, but I think that the primary appetite that people have for media fact-checking is when the candidate they oppose is doing well and they think they're telling lies. Then, then the individuals want the media to be the force multiplier and use the power of its position uh, to basically contest the points that the individuals would like to contest if they had the um, ability to do so. Well, my other thought, um, I, I think that another problem, and this comes from my marketing background, I'm not sure that there is a media solution for every bad product. And my fear for two years going through today is that Hillary Clinton was simply a bad product. I mean, she may be a, a good lady, she may be well qualified to be president, but a huge number of people didn't want more Clintonism didn't want to go back to the to the 1990s and the legacy of sleaze of the Bill Clinton administration. And because of that, I think that Hillary was so tainted a product that it wasn't a question of Hillary versus Trump. It was a question of Hillary versus no. Uh, and that's and, and no one. And it just happened to have orange hair and an orange complexion. That's my two cents on it. So that idea, I think, Gary, you, you mentioned something about that this was created and the media actually supported this, uh, what you call a horse race? Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> you know, there was a false equivalency almost from day one. <clears throat> I agree completely with John that Hillary was a flawed candidate from the very beginning. Um, she sort of put herself in her own box, you know, because she's been accused of being, uh, I mean, the Clintons are sort of the poster family for paper play politics for decades. Uh, but she put herself in this position of, because she wasn't transparent about stuff that was really pretty minor, that she was seen as dishonest. And then they could play that dishonesty card. And every time there's one more email or one more weekly leak or one more little thing, it kept that narrative running, and the, and, the, and the news channels did that. I mean, they even read, I, I only watched Rachel Maddow, so I don't even know what the hell's going on with the other people. But even on her show, they read out loud WikiLeaks that later were discredited. They didn't really happen. And so, you know, she was in this terrible box. But, but the other problem I have with her campaign, and I had it from day one, is other than I'm not as bad as the other guy, it wasn't about anything. I was on a call like this one this morning at about 10 o'clock, and, and there's, not, there's about equal number of people. I said, could somebody please tell me what are the two policy issues that the electorate understood that Hillary stood for? Just tell me, what are the two? And everybody hemmed and hawed, and we had 19 or nobody knew. I mean, you know, the campaign was really poorly run, and they just counted on the fact that Trump was so despicable that nobody would vote for him. And not only that, too, I also think they discounted Steve Banton's position as well. Because Absolutely. when he joined the campaign, he made it all about image. He made it all about media. You know, the first Saturday after he joined the campaign, Trump's first speech was in front of a 1,000 foot monitor with a flag waving in the background. It was fabulous. And I said, who, who put that image together? That, if you turned the audio off, 
you you thought that this guy was, I mean, the the man, I mean, for America. And so it was just wonderful how they began to put the narrative together, calm him down, you know, put issues in front of him and things of this nature. So I think that Steve Banton really made a real powerful move here with, with, with Trump. And I think- and if, if I could quickly comment on that and then I'll shut up, Jerry Lynn, that, you know, it, the, if somebody- was working on a dissertation or a paper or another project and wanted to follow Breitbart and see to what extent the issues they espouse become part of policy in the first hundred days or the first one year. I think that would be, I mean, John's sort of doing that with Limbaugh, but I think this would be fascinating because Breitbart has an agenda. It's a very anti-American agenda. Mm. So, I mean, he's, and he's a tremendous, uh, he's a tremendous propagandist. And so, Will their agenda become part of American policy, become mm. part of Trump's policy? That's interesting. And I have no idea what the answer is to that. But when you look at media's impact and influence on the public sphere, I think it would be a fascinating question to ask. Yeah. Well, there's an interesting thing that keeps coming out, and that is that idea of imagery. Everybody keeps talking about it, even Pam's point of the lizard brain or that sort of a prime, it resonates with us primarily. But also, Gary, you brought, you brought up WikiLeaks briefly. I think that's a big area for us to explore, that whole idea of um, why was it such an unstoppable source? Russia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, Gary, this is Pam, the, there's a really interesting presumption that somehow it was accurate. In other words, we just, I mean, so many people took that all for face value without ever questioning the source or the, you know, the Assange's motivations or, or any of that stuff. And so what we saw was a very interesting release of information to maintain the emotional pitch against Hillary. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a you know from a media perspective that's sort of critical, Pam. It's like it's like uh, you know did the did we give them credibility they didn't deserve? Uh, I was on a call what a week ago with some of our <clears throat> DOT Department of State friends, and um, I said you know Obama needs to speak to the nation, not as a Democrat, but he needs to speak to the nation about Russia's attempts to influence our elections and the steps that were being taken to prevent it. And then we need to take an overt step. We need to shut down WikiLeaks. We need to shut off their electricity. We can do it. We know how to do that. Should We need to shut down the Russian uh, access to the internet for 24 hours. We need to take an overt step and say, we will not tolerate this. That would have changed the election. Um, Gary, this is Anita and everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I, I agree with that. I just really felt like um, with WikiLeaks and with um, you know Russia and you know just the hacking that was going on um, to not take an oh, I mean just to take a, a really um, strong um, stance against that and say that no foreign entity is going to attempt to uh, affect an election and get away with it. And to not do that during the election and more grievous to not do it now, which I think Gary would be a, a, a good step to take because what happens is these, so much has become normalized um, through this election. The things that we used to be appalled by ha are now just normal. And I was, at, I was at my school today and listening to my fifth and sixth graders talk about the election and the kids who are in homes who voted for Trump they were, everything they said was a Trump talking part, point in the kids who were in homes that voted for Hillary. You heard those talking points and they sounded, you know, and here are these kids. And this is, you know, th this is the first election that they're old enough to remember. And this is, my daughter um, woke up this morning. The first thing she asked me is, mommy, did, did Hillary win? And I, and I could, and I had to try to think of a way to tell her no without bringing her to, you know, so I, I knew the tears would come when I said she did not. Um, I remember I had, did a really good job. She, had, she hadn't heard a single thing, she's nine, by Trump. And then the one time that I was at my sister's house and she heard Trump call Hillary crooked Hillary, and she says, Mom, well, why would he call her crooked? Is she crooked? And then I had to address that, you know, for a nine-year-old. And, um, and so these things have become so normalized. And, um, 
you know, so that is something that will have to be addressed because can they ever become, you know, can we ever take those back and um, put them back, you know, kind of in perspective. And I think you talked about that, Pam, in that email about media literacy. But, and but this, this is, this is Susan. I, I just wanted to, I, I guess that's one of the, the things uh, when you were talking about um, uh, why people would take that information and never question it. And, and uh, the, the things that I read indicated that media literacy is such a problem and that most people uh, read what they see, they follow the headlines, and, and that's what their um, opinions are based on, the headlines. The other thing uh, that I just want to add is that, you know, we did this, this paper on the, the memo on race relations um, for the Kettering Foundation, and, and uh, Karen and I did, it, did the media analysis. And one of the things that I looked at, because I did the conservative media and the New York Times, and, and I found that most people don't stick to one publication or another because they may get most, they may look at most of their media on television, but most people, because we spend so much time with digital media, are exposed to varying points of view. So most people are more in the middle, but those people who are, particularly with Republicans, now Republicans, and it's not all Republicans, it's only those who are the most active, who are the ones who watch Facebook generally for most of their information. That is generally their primary source of information. But for all other voters, they're kind of in the middle because they get their information from so many different sources and they are exposed to other kinds of opinions. What the research said was the reason that it matters for those who watch Fox the most is because those are the most active Republicans and the most active Republicans are the ones who are most engaged in the policies or in the politics. They're the ones who decide who the candidates will be, who determine what issues are on the platform, and then ultimately what candidates we get to select from. That, that small, narrow group with that small level of tremendous amount of influence affects what we see, but does not truly re reflect the majority of the people. So Susan, this is Pam. Are you arguing that, that it's Fox News that's, that's shaping these opinions? Because my research, my research indicated that no. it was exactly the other way around. No, this said, the, the, the research that I found said that it's shaping the opinion of those who are the most engaged Republicans, not all Republicans. Okay, yeah, because that the thing about who, Fox News is that they show what people want to see and they monitor that every 30 minutes. And so if they're right. not... You know, so so I would argue that yeah, you may be right that there that that small vocal group watches Fox News, but I would right. argue then that Fox mm -hmm. programming is catering to their interests, not think, the other way around. I think on a larger yeah. level, on a larger level though, Pam, um, you know, it's 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 completely possible, and maybe a lot of people do this to only be exposed to things that we already agree with. And so right. the people that watch Fox already agree with it. If you watch MSNBC, you already agree with it. CNN, I don't know what CNN stands for, actually. But maybe you already agree with that, too. But we can isolate ourselves from any other information. Uh, where, it gets, where it gets interesting is that um, if you have enough money, uh, you can move opinion in a whole, you can, you, can, you can move perception in a number of different directions. Let me, let me give you one example. Uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, two different foundations, and they weren't called PACs in those days, but two different foundations uh, raised $300 million to make Ronald Reagan an icon. Uh, if you, they would name anything that didn't move after him, a school, a road, a bridge, a, they didn't care, whatever it was, a stable. And, uh, and they spent that money naming everything after Ronald Reagan. And the, the intention was that they want to make him this, this, this icon. The Republicans didn't have a lot of icons. 
and they succeeded in doing so. Now, you might say he deserved it. You might say he didn't. But it was an intentional act. And, and, and we see that more and more. I mean, I'm not a Hillary Clinton fan. I voted for her, but I'm not a fan. But an extraordinary amount of money has been spent, not over the last year or two years or five years, but over the last decade discrediting her. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's a tough one. I mean, uh, imagine that, uh, let's just take John for, as an example. We've got 27 people on the call. So imagine 26 of us just devoted the next week to saying bad things about John Robinson. We could just do it like on Moodle. Well, by the end of the week, he'd have a problem. And if you can do that long enough, frequently enough, hard enough, people start to believe it. It's all perception. And I, and I also think that there's a double standard when it comes to the celebrity factor. He yep. is a celebrity. They hold him to a different standard than they do someone who has served the government for 30 years. They automatically assume, the public assumes that she will know more than him. He is a celebrity, and that celebrity factor also added a few points, I think, to this whole thing, too. The fact that people have seen him, he's the, you know, the apprentice, he's, you know, these reality shows, and, you know, I just think the celebrity. I, I, I want to say, I, we don't watch TV, so all of our news come from social media and, and the internet. I mean, we never watch, except for YouTube. So... Everybody was attacking Trump and everybody was attacking supporters, at least in my circle or what I got on Twitter or what I got from the news. I mean, the New Yorker, uh, CNN, everybody was attacking him. And, but, but I still think the problem was that we kept making the narrative of minorities. And I am a member of two. I'm gay and I'm Mexican. So we, we kept trying to impose our narrative to white people that are still the majority and they don't have a true reason to care. So the, the WikiLeaks, uh, everybody, the people that got scared about the WikiLeaks were because that was a problem that affected everyone. The attack on women, as sad and, and crass as it, as it may sound, concerned only to women and the attack on Mexican concerned only to Mexicans. It was only when we realized that he was attacking all these minorities that we came together and started uh, fighting Trump, but before we didn't care for each other. So I think the problem, wh one big part of the problem is that we didn't include in the main narrative the problems of the majority, people that still are the 70% of the population. We kept so, talking about how he attacked, sorry, Mexicans and Muslims and women, but we didn't talk about the people that were going to lose their jobs with, uh, because the coal industry is dying and nobody talked about the new technologies coming about the self-driving cars and all these people that are going to lose their jobs and, or AI. So Carlos, it sounds like, and, and you know, it's, there seem, it seems to be some conflicting conversation around this topic, whether, whether it was the content just wasn't put out there or whether if a certain statement was said over and over again, no matter how true or false it was, it is started to started. be as truth to everyone. Um, I just wanted to make sure because Cynthia, I think, tried to jump in several times and was unsuccessful. Cynthia, did you want to add something right now? I'm going to take that as, as no. Okay, go okay, ahead. Go ahead. I think importantly that um, what you're saying, Carlos, uh, is that where AI and robotics are already taking over jobs, jobs not moving so much from Michigan to Mexico, but more Michigan to Texas. And we, um, you know, they, they don't talk about it. Neither candidate really goes into that because it doesn't support or advance their narratives in the sense that not only Donald Trump stated it, but Hillary didn't say it, but they want you to believe that they are the only one that can fix it. And that is, you know, that is the, the part they play in the political game. When we all pretty much know that the president is not going to change things overnight. Um, certainly what, what Gary said earlier about Ronald Reagan bears out, you know, Carter did a lot of things at the end of his, his term that, you know, deregulation, these kinds of things that uh, 
that bode well for Reagan. You know, they, they give Reagan credit for freeing the Iranian hostages, but Carter actually pulled that off. And uh, then Bush did some changes, including raising taxes that, that got us out of the recession uh, that Clinton took credit for. So no one's really concerned about the reality on the field. They just want to paint that picture that we talked about earlier in the conversation so that it advances their narrative as being the person who can fix it. Well, it's, you know, it, it's, no one wants to tell the truths, you know, that the fact of the matter is manufacturing has made a tremendous comeback in the United States without any corresponding increase in well-paying jobs. Uh, the new Ford plant turns out twice as many Fords with one fiftieth the employees as they did previously. These are ro the robots are a bigger problem than China or Mexico, but nobody wants to say that. That just I mean that's just going to depress everybody. But politics, you know, it's it starts at the street level. Uh, you know that you ha you have to be in touch with what the hell's happening with people on the street, and if you can if you can tap into that. And if you can respond to the way they see their needs, real or imagined, which is what I think Trump did very effectively, uh, you've got a pretty good hand. Uh, when we go back to the Democrats, just historically, they've always been strongest when they were on the side of working people. When Social Security passed, no Republican support. Medicare passed, one Republican vote. Minimum wage passed with no Republican support. Child labor laws, going all the way back to FDR, no Republican support. So the Democrats are always stronger when they're on the side of working people, regardless of color, regardless of background, regardless of any stuff like that. And they moved away from this. They moved away from it big time in the last decade, and they got to rethink this thing. So hey, Michael, I have a comment about um, what kinds of proactive steps can we use, or you know, how can we heal? And and uh, I think Michael, you were talking about with social media. Not just social media, but in general. I mean, I think Carlos incredibly eloquent the way you wrote what you did to me. And that is stop calling anyone. See, I didn't support Trump, but I've been called stupid and I've been called ignorant for accepting the results of this election. I'm not racist. I'm not a misogynist. I'm not a bigot. I am a citizen of the USA. And I feel that those who have died for my country deserve my respect to accept the outcome. And Carlos, you said it beautifully. We need to start looking at what caused the outcome and how can we work proactively so that we all agree that the outcome next time is with two candidates that should be there. So that's where my concern is, that proactively we need to construct the construction, <laughs> not destruction. And I look at CalExit. And I look at the, the comments being said. Truthfully, I'm at the point, Jerry Lynn, when people say they're going to move, then do it. Then leave the country. I so as, as the leaders <laughs> in media psychology, how do we proactively share with people what you're doing now, spewing hate and venom, is exactly what you said you hated about Trump. So my issue is let's, let's be proactive. Let's share love and unity. Okay, I'm done, Danny. Okay, Christina. Um, did anybody besides, uh, did any of you have an experience where you posted your distress over Trump winning and get that vile and venomous response from social media? I said the only one. <laughs> What? Yes, actually, I did the opposite. Is I just stayed clear of posting today because I uh, assumed that that the, it was going to be prime for um, uh, uh, attack. Right. But I do. So go ahead. Go ahead. Well, okay. So I posted my distress because I work with women, female survivors of sexual assault, and so on. And um, there, uh, there's a lot of triggering. And, you know, some of the Trump rhetoric, you know, and you know what it is. And then my daughter also posted, she posted a video of herself um, last night. She was crying and she expressed herself and, um, and she, she was, made herself vulnerable, posted it on um, her, her page. And the, um, the attacks against uh, me were mild against 
uh, compared to the attacks against her, which he screenshotted and, um, and put up as a new post. And it did support, you know, our worries, uh, you know, about is the example, is the, is the media ex um, influence uh, on us? I mean, seeing Trump over and over um, making these terrible um, derogatory statements towards women, will that impact, you know, men and how they respond to women? And, and I don't know if there's a direct response here, but it is really horrific. I mean, the response that she got for expressing her feelings. And so that's, that's something I'm interested in and I'm worried about. It, it's whether, um, you know, Trump's aggressive manner somehow triggers something in, in, the, in the psyche of people that's maybe, you know, I read that they, um, the way you were parented, if you were um, um, parented by authoritarian parents, you were more likely to be right wing. And authoritarian parents, uh, they, um, they yell and they're, and they're punishment oriented. And that's how it is. And I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, it wasn't really about his messaging and appealing to the workers as much as it was. He seemed like, you know, a big, a big punishing father that was going to protect everybody or let the, um, um, let the people with all these implicit feelings um, express themselves, you know, in a negative way towards women, towards minorities. And the last question that I have is, um, why, um, why Clinton um, didn't debunk, find a better way to debunk all the myths um, that were going on? Because like in the post, you know, in the responses towards what I wrote, people constantly repeated um, you know, that she's going to start World War III, she killed babies at 39 weeks, that she's murdered the people at Benghazi, and all these, you know, all these myths. <laughs> there were no sound bites or visual pictures painted to debunk these myths, and they're still very strong in people's minds. So they had no, you know, they're full of ammunition against Hillary and full of, um, you know, um, thinking that, that loudness and, and brashness is some kind of sign of strength with Trump that I just feel like he just swept the emotions right, right away. And I don't, I don't think he's some big worker's hero. My rant is over. I think one of the problems is, is that we didn't, we didn't succeed in, in making uh, people feel empathy for these women being attacked. And when we had, when we were sharing social media where all these videos for, from BuzzFeed and, and I don't know what else, made by millennials, women, s smiling, good looking, and we didn't see any p real pain. We didn't see anybody crying. We didn't uh, feel it inside our hearts, all the pain. We, did, uh, we, we were just seeing uh, college educated people, uh, privileged, young people attacking white people and really we couldn't empathize with uh, suffering and when you're a man it's very difficult unless unless you, you really get involved into the narrative it's, it's really difficult to understand what women go through i mean i i'm not afraid of walking outside at night I'm not afraid. I mean, if somebody got, if I go to a club and somebody touch, touches me, touches my bottom, I, I don't feel violated or insulted. I just, whatever, crazy dude. Or, but as a woman, it's different. And I mean, women are smaller. Women are weaker. I mean, physically, and uh, and we don't know that because media fails to portray that. The the women that are portrayed in media are either helpless or the strong Amazons like Wonder Woman and we think that women, I mean, we, they tell us that we're equal and we expect that uh, women will react as, as women react. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that we didn't feel the suffering of these people. I see you and, and you get emotional right now. I didn't see that on the videos that were 
being shared around. I just saw women inviting Ivanka Trump to leave her father, but they were all being sassy and smiling, and, and you don't really get the suffering. You have to uh, think about it. You don't feel it. Can I make a quick suggestion, uh, Jerry Lynn? Uh, the, um, right as we speak, there are thousands of people marching in the streets in nine of America's major, major cities. Uh, my guess is these protests will grow. Uh, I'm expecting millions of people to protest the inauguration itself. I don't think any of this is a good thing, by the way. Uh, in my spare time, I love screwing with people. I love, dis I, I love political argument. And here's how I approach it. My neighbor across the street is a proud Trump supporter. She was just delighted this morning. And uh, so I told her, I said, you know, well, congratulations. And I certainly hope that they don't make the cuts to Social Security and Medicare that are being threatened. And she just panicked. Everybody's got a hot button, you know. And so if you want to get in an argument about politics, don't do it globally or generally. Don't go into who's a better person or a bad person. You know, there are so many issues. I mean, it's fascinating in Kentucky. Kentucky Connect is the most popular healthcare program in the nation. 89% of the population in Kentucky thinks it's just great. 66% of the very same people think Obamacare is a complete disaster. It's exactly the same thing. Obamacare in Kentucky is called Kentucky Connect. That's where we are with people. You know, so I think there's so many different levers you can pull and buttons you can push and conversations you can have. But as I say, it all starts on the street. Be as specific as you can be when you talk to people. Uh, you know, we've got common ground everywhere, but not necessarily universal common ground between all of us. You know, that's a good point, Gary. I, um, uh, I was at work today and uh, my friend was talking to her father-in-law who also works at the same school and he was saying how he went to the doctor for issues with his kidneys and he was complaining about everything and all of that Obamacare. She says, Oh, don't worry. You won't have it too much longer. And he kind of got this look on his face because he hadn't really thought about, you know, that the fact that, you know, he has this serious kidney condition and the only way he can have coverage is, you know, with Obamacare in, you know, uh, California covered, it's what it's called here, or covered California. And um, so you're right, be small, informed, you know, bring this to their attention and make them realize, oh, I, you know, I, and I think that's, that's a good point. I, I have a question. This is Susan, and, and I wonder if anyone has given thought to or or has considered doing the research about the long-term consequences and i think it was Danita, i'm not sure who mentioned uh the children um but the discourse has been so crude and has almost given an okay to being insulting more so than than is ordinary. Uh, in some instances, Hillary didn't take the bait like them, uh, continuously trying to make her um, attach uh, radicalized uh, to the word Muslim. She wouldn't do it. Um, but in so many ways, he has just created these negative memes and and the aggression uh, of that that emanated from him as a, a, a candidate based on his message that was reverberated throughout his 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 supporters and the way they treat people in the audience and the disrespect for people with disabilities and I I'm concerned about the long term consequences of that and how that, when it's played so, over and over again, is going to impact people. Does anyone have any thoughts so, so, on so where if I, if I can paraphrase and make sure I've got it right, you're talking about the, the imagery of, of Trump uh, during the campaign. Because, see, the, 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 chal the challenge is mm -hmm. with 
research, as you know, is that what you're talking about is a longitudinal study. And mm-hmm. there are too many different points along the way that could be the effect that are um, not related, directly related to the imagery of the, the campaign. I think it's an interesting um, I, idea to, to try to understand, but I'm, I'm wondering if that's even um, a possibility because we don't know what's going to happen in the next few days. We don't know what his presidency would bring. Um, and and it, it's also interesting what Gary talked about, and I didn't realize it was actually already happening, but the um, people that are out there protesting and, and, and how, how might social media be able to affect that protest? And are we, are we seeing um, something along the lines of what we saw in Egypt a few years, or years ago? Or is something like that going to, to happen? Um, you know, social media plays a, a big, huge role here. Um, and I know that there are people are, the chat's going so fast, I can't even keep up with it. So go ahead and jump in, folks. So one thing, hi, this is, this is Alton. Um, I had to, I had to take in everything just to get some uh, input and think about where I stand on this. But um, one of the things I kind of felt about the Hillary campaign, and I was a supporter, but um, was that it seemed like her message was, like her identity that she was trying to put out there was very schizophrenic, if you will. Um, kind of hopping around and, and changing and morphing, or taking on Bernie's ideas, and then saying, well, if you want to continue your messaging, you're going to tell us that our stuff that Obama has done, you should uh, follow me. And that, and also, if you want to break the glass ceiling, then you should follow me. I mean, all of these things were, were said, but they really didn't connect to, I felt they didn't connect to individuals on how her presidency would affect them or change their lives um, and add that kernel of, of, um, of uh, realistic or even just um, a visual idea of how their lives are going to be affected. And with Trump, on his end, he was showing, hey, look, if you, I see that you, you've been affected uh, in your lives. And this is how we want this. This is how what I'm proposing to do. Even though they weren't in specific plans, they, they he really hit that. And because Hillary, I felt in in her messaging, kept going back and forth and changing and shifting, it really didn't connect to the voters. And specifically near the end of the campaign, it did seem to focus on she's going to break this glass ceiling. And and if 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 you weren't if that wasn't something that you were connecting with. You weren't gonna. You weren't gonna align with her. I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks. I think that um, uh, Dave has mentioned this on the chat quite a bit. Other people have as well. I mean, like Jerry Lynn. I should have taken speed reading in college on these chats. But <laughs> um, I was trying. I was trying to keep up. Yeah. Brilliant comments, and and we will this, transpose those for everybody this, so that we can this, refer back. This may be a fairly dangerous time right now. Uh, that uh, so there's. Tens of thousands of people in the streets tonight, uh, they may dissipate and go away. Even in the Gore-Bush election, there were no public protests. They may grow. I mean, we may see millions of people in the streets uh, toward the nullification of an election. Uh, Regardless of where we stand on any issue, that's a very dangerous thing. Uh, You know, it's a very dangerous time. Right now, it's young people, people of color, uh, mostly inner city people. If... If other classes start to join them, uh, which they might, it's somebody mentioned uh, Egypt. Uh, For the U.S., I mean, it's a it's a very dangerous thing, and I I, I think that we need to articulate the importance of working toward a different outcome in two years, but not necessarily trying to nullify the one we just had. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, everyone. We're at the hour. Um, I I found this uh, an interesting and and useful conversation. I would like to put some more together in the near future. I think we'll have a, a lot more to discuss.